Minister. Mr. Deputy Chairman, sir. We've had a, a detailed and an elaborate discussion on these uh, four legislations which are essential to give effect to the goods and services tax. Earlier we had an opportunity to discuss threadbare this issue when the Constitution Amendment Bill itself was discussed in both Houses of Parliament. At the very outset, I'd like to thank uh, all the members who've spoken on this because the broad approach uh, almost of every member has been in support of this legislation. Even the Constitution Amendment Bill was passed unanimously by both Houses of Parliament. And therefore, I am extremely grateful to all political parties in both Houses of Parliament as also in the state governments which extended support to it. Not only has it been passed in these Houses, we have a GST Council where 29 state governments and two union territories with a legislature are represented besides the central government. Except uh, Tamil Nadu, which had reservations when the constitutional amendment was passed, but after it was passed, it's a law applicable to all the states. And therefore, even the honorable representatives from Tamil Nadu, along with the other states, have been actively cooperating in endeavoring to see that the GST itself becomes a reality. I'm sure. Uh, all of us have learned from the experience of the last 10, 11 years. A lot of comments have been exchanged uh, about what happened and why it was delayed, consequences of the delay itself. Originally, the idea was mooted out in the budget of 2006. The Constitution Amendment itself was introduced in 2011. And initially, it's a fact that when an idea as radical as this is moved, it will take time before people digest the full implications of that idea. Under our constitutional scheme, uh, both center and states were empowered to levy different kinds of taxes. The central government was levying uh, the manufacturing tax, which is the excise duties. We were levying the service tax. The tax on sale or VAT was being levied by the state governments. There were several other taxes from entertainment tax to luxury tax, purchase tax, entry tax, octroi, which was being levied by the state governments. And therefore, the initial impact was that many states felt that the constitutional structure under which we levy our taxes and the center levies their taxes, are we going to lose our jurisdiction itself? And therefore, there was obviously an initial reluctance. In fact, Mr. Alan Sharma quoted the Madhya Pradesh finance minister, who I think was most vocal, along with Tamil Nadu, in raising this question over years, that uh, why should the states lose their right? There were several states, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, which were manufacturing states, which felt that this being a destination tax, the consuming states are going to benefit more. And we as manufacturing states, producing states, have invested in the infrastructure for manufacturing. So we are going to lose revenue. The consuming states are going to gain. And therefore, how is it that we are going to be compensated itself? 
And I must admit that from 2006 onwards when this experiment was made and thereafter the empowered committee of state finance ministers was constituted, Each step under different governments for all of us has been a learning experience how to improve upon this idea. And therefore to compensate the states which anticipated or feared the loss of revenue, the provisions had to be brought in. And they had to be brought in by a constitutional amendment even with regard to the language a considerable amount was spent. The standing committee during the last government and the present government spent a lot of time. Thereafter, we appointed a select committee of this house which tried, which Derek O'Brien referred to, which tried to work out a consensus. Even after the select committee, my friends in the Congress party raised certain issues. We had a lot of discussions with them. Some of those concerns we were able to address over and above what the select committee has, had recommended. And some we were able to persuade them not to insist upon because a larger consensus was being brought about. And therefore this bill, I have no hesitation in conceding that uh, it's not a bill for which one government or one person or any individual should take a credit. It's a collective property in which states, political parties, central governments, successive governments have all contributed to it. And I have no difficulty in sharing uh, the credit for this with everyone, particularly the state governments, because we are now creating a situation which was originally not anticipated in the Constitution. And I'll explain why. In the original constitution, you have clearly defined areas where either the center tax has jurisdiction or the state has jurisdiction. There is a central list, there is a state list. Then you have the concurrent list, where if the center chooses to act, then the center gets primacy. The state will be excluded. So there is no gray area in the constitution where both center and states simultaneously exercise power. It's either the center or the states. But when as a part of this 10-year consensus building, and what was drafted as a constitution amendment existed from the original draft which was prepared in 2011 and introduced, there were additions, improvements made by the standing committee, then by the select committee. Some changes made by the empowered committee. A new situation was created. The states decided that they will not be levying these indirect taxes. The center decided we will not be levying these indirect taxes. And instead, both jointly gave birth to the concept of a goods and services tax. And the constitution was amended and a new provision, Article 246A, capital A, was put in, where both center and state simultaneously got the power to levy the goods and services tax. This is the only tax which is going to be now simultaneously levied by both of them. How do you levy it? Who will administer it? Center or state? So Article 279 capital A was brought in in which it was mentioned that the administrative machinery for taking the decisions and for implementing it will also be jointly by the center and the states. So each one of those concepts was specifically defined in the constitution itself. Now we have a situation that you will have a goods and services tax council. 
It will comprise of 29 finance ministers of the states, the union finance minister, the MOS from the center, two finance ministers from two union territories, the legislature, Delhi and Puducherry. 32 legislative bodies represented there. They will have the power to make a recommendation. <coughs> the plenary power remains with parliament and the state legislation. But then what you decide in the council, of course we can always ask the council to reconsider it, but what you decide in the council becomes a federal arrangement between the center and the states and between the states and the states themselves. <coughs> and once 32 of these bodies come to a particular decision, whether it's with regard to rates or it's with regard to the draft legislations, one of the, today we are at a stage where the draft legislations have been prepared by these 32 representatives. You have four of these legislations, the CGST law, the UTGST law, the IGST law and the compensation law, which has to be approved by the central legislature. And you have a mirror image SGST law, which is a mirror image of the CGST law which has to be approved by 31 legislative bodies in the states. And therefore, when we exercise this power, and I'm glad uh, most people have adopted that attitude, we have all to be guided by this federal concern that this is an arrangement which has been arrived at, and therefore unilaterally one of the parties can't disturb that arrangement. Because if unilaterally one disturb, and this is the very first test the GST Council effectively is India's first federal institution which is functioning. And therefore, we have been careful enough in the GST Council. We've had 14 meetings. Each meeting has gone on for several hours, at times several days. And we have tried to reach a consensus on every issue. And we have consciously avoided a vote. Because federalism is not an issue, federal decisions are not issues which you can just uh, resolve by just voting. Because we wanted to consciously create a precedent whereby a process of deliberative democracy, you are able to resolve those issues. And once those arrangements are finalized, if we find that there is something imperfect in the arrangement which is finalized, I am sure each one of the political parties here is directly or indirectly represented there. They will make the corrections, and in an experiment of this kind, there will always be scope for an improvement. And therefore, when you say, you have legislated, we have all collectively legislated through that body. And these are unanimous drafts prepared by that body, which have come up before us. And, the, and if I may just point out, over the last 10 years, we've had uh, 30 subgroups and committees. How much has been the interaction with chambers, industries, etc.? Administrative ministries have held it. 31,000 industry professionals have been trained. 51,000 officers of the center and the state governments have been trained. 175 meetings at the officer level which have taken place. There is a legal committee which finally prepares the draft which come to the GST Council, which comprises of predominantly officers of the state governments. And there are some officers who have a very active role in the, in what they, in the drafting of this because they've been well versed, they've been trained, uh, uh, they're special commissioners who've been handling the taxation in their states itself. And therefore, this is the extent of work each one of them has put in. And ultimately, the object seems to be that the country, the revenues of the center, the revenues of the state, industry and trade must benefit. Today, any person doing business in India has an interface with multiple taxes. He has an interface with multiple assessing authorities. After this is implemented, 
he is going to have an interface only with one authority and the decision of the council is that it, in a large number of cases it could be as high as 95 percent the IT network itself will em emerge the self assessments made there will eventually be the assessments and it's only a very few cases which will be taken up either at the state level or at the central level for audit and when one of the two because there is dual control takes it up for audit in accordance with the principles that they've laid down what the state will then decide is binding on the center and vice versa and then the sharing of the revenue on basis of the collections itself will take place there will be a free flow of goods and services there will be concerns Mumbai as you said will lose Octodoy but Maharashtra will start getting a share of the service tax that comes from Mumbai and a bulk and probably the largest share of service tax comes from uh, Mumbai itself today they were not getting this therefore the, the factual situation today is that with the the advantages of GST the free flow of goods and services which takes place a lot of convenience in the system itself is going to come in several issues have been raised in the course of the debate and these have been consciously considered why multiple taxes the last honorable member who spoke raised the issue of textile somebody raised the issue of uh, some other products biscuits today you have a large number of products which are zero rated so you can't have one rate where everybody pays that tax. Many will have to remain zero rated. You have products which are marginally taxed. So you have the 5% rate. You have 12, 18 and the higher rate of 28. The simple formulation in the first instance is going to be what is your present rate of taxation? And if you add up your taxation, you can be fitted against the nearest rate that exists. And that nearest rate that exists <coughs> is the one against which you will be fitted. And that is what is in the first instance going to happen. Why are, what will happen to the cesses? A lot of these cesses are going to be which are on indirect taxes are going to be removed some of the cesses on luxury or sin goods will remain so those cesses itself will continue to remain and those cesses itself will be used as a pool in order to provide the money which has to go into the compensation package itself that is how the GST council itself has worked itself out so somebody mentioned 40% is mentioned in IGST. That's the cap. If 18 is the rate, then it will be 9 and 9. If it's 28, it will be 14 and 14. So it's not going to be 40 is the cap. That is the outer limit. That is not uh, so that once you raise it, you don't have to amend it at every stage. The caps are always higher, the bound rates are always higher than the applied rates. And that is why the rate of 40 itself has been put. What will happen to this uh, cess on luxury and sin products, which will be used for five years for compensation? After five years, it may be subsumed into the taxes itself. The council will take a decision. That is what has been decided with regard to the five-year cess itself. Petroleum products. Now, petroleum was a deal breaker. Even under the old government, it was a deal breaker. The states were not agreeing. So, with great difficulty, we persuaded the states we'll bring petroleum into the GST, but zero rate it till such time the council decides to impose a rate. 
On alcohol, the states were not in agreement. On real estate, and therefore you, while the GST experiment succeeds, hopefully one day petroleum will come into it. Once the states decide for which you may have to change the constitution, you'll then decide about alcohol. About real estate. About real estate, the states had decided that they didn't want to bring it in. They had some difficulty with regard to stamp duty and so on, which are otherwise not impacted. The chief economic advisor made a detailed presentation to the states on the advantages of bringing real estate into the GST. You don't have to amend the constitution for that. Thereafter, the Delhi government and the finance minister of Delhi, the deputy chief minister of Delhi, who is also the finance minister, circulated a note and made a detailed presentation wanting real estate to come in. Some of the states started supporting this idea. And then in the, one of the meetings held a few weeks ago, they said, let us implement it. We'll see the experience. And in the first year itself, we will revisit our decision with regard to real estate. And hopefully, if we agree, we'll bring real estate into it. Speaking for myself, we, I was in favor of real estate. The Delhi government was in favor of real estate. The chief economic advisor made a presentation. Several states were appeared. And let me tell you the manner in which the GST council has been functioning. Not on one issue has the council divided itself on political lines. There have been issues where two Congress chief finance ministers have been at odds with each other. There have been issues on which defending the rights of the states, BJP finance ministers have argued with me. So then, and finally after discussion, a wire media is arrived at and a decision therefore is, uh, is, is taken itself. And I am quite sure that issues like petroleum, issues like real estate, in foreseeable future, once the experiment of the GST itself picks up, one by one the council itself will take a decision. And since we've created a federal institution, we can leave it to the federal institution itself to decide as to what is to be done. Mr. Anand Sharma raised a very valid issue. Several service tax uh, players, telecom, IT, uh, uh, banking, insurance, made a detailed presentation in person to the council for a centralized registration. The act had no provision. And therefore the states in one voice said we will separately register it. Registration is an online process. And therefore getting a similar identical online registration in 20 or 30 states is not a very difficult thing. What if you get audited by different states? That's the bigger challenge. So we agreed to put in clause 148 in the CGST law that for a category of states you can have, for instance, you can say for a major serv service tax player, a bank or a telecom company or an IT operator, a joint audit of a center or the state can take place and you can have a central audit, clause 148 itself permits it. So therefore they created an arrangement. Today there will be a separate registration, which is an online registration. But there is a provision as far as a separate audit itself uh, is concerned for a particular category. Jammu and Kashmir in the Constitution Amendment itself and in the law is not included because of Article 370. Now not being included will keep Jammu and Kashmir outside the benefit of the input credit chain. So consumers there are going to lose out. Any producers are there going to lose out. So the consumers itself may have to pay a price where they don't get the input credit of what taxes are already paid. And therefore Jammu and Kashmir under their constitutional requirement will have to bring their own legislation. And that legislation I am told is likely, which will integrate itself into the central law itself. And therefore, they will become a part of the chain. And as a gesture itself, even though JNK is still not a part of this whole arrangement, the Honorable Finance Minister of JNK attends every meeting and participates actively because JNK is also going to, being a consuming state particularly, they are going to benefit as far as. Uh, uh, this arrangement is concerned. 
a lot of questions have been raised about GSTN. And why was this arrangement made? Some objections have been raised, but I was surprised when Mr. Sibyl raised this question. Between the empowered committee and the finance ministry, during the UPA government, a lot of detailed exercise has gone into it. The empowered committee went into it. There are billions of vouchers every month which GSTN is going to match. And therefore, the IT skills, as you yourself rightly mentioned, have to be of globally the best standard. It will be the biggest network in the country in that sense. Now, should that network be run within the government itself? Will you be able to have the flexibility inside the government to get the best uh, of the talent available within the scale, salaries, discipline of the government itself? Or should there be a deep and pervasive government control and yet flexibility to hire and function with the very best? And I think under your government, you made a conscious choice. And the choice was that 24.5% each, that is 49%, is held between the central and the state governments. The balance 51 goes to entities like some banks in the private sector, some one of the LIC housing and I think uh, one of the offshoots of the NSC. Strictly 51% could be considered to be outside the government. But then over the years, the wisdom of the government was and that of the empowered committee was that while giving it the flexibility of only a 49% government, out of the board of 14 members, those private banking institutions the, and also the insurance institutions will have three. Government has seven and four are independent people selected with gov majority government participation. So the board is really 50% government, four independent nominated by the government. There was another Nilikani committee appointed uh, when the UPA was in power which recommended all this structure. And only three from those so-called other institutions. All key decisions to be taken by a special, some key decisions by a special resolution. Shareholders agreement for key decisions, an affirmative vote of the government is required. So unless the government of India agrees and the, all the government of the states agree, the decision is not taken. And headed by some officers sent on deputation from the government itself. So what was the arrangement of GSTN? To be able to hire the best talent pool that 30 billion vouchers in a month can be matched and this data maintained. You give it the flexibility of 49% government so that you get the best pool. But the management structure has a deep and pervasive governmental control. And then in the act itself, you put in clause 133 that any information which is made public becomes a penal offense. So not only do you build the firewalls around the structure, but you also make this. Now this demand has been raised uh, repeatedly, change the structure. At some stage, if we all feel the structure is to be changed, structures can always be changed. Government can acquire 1% or 2% more shares. But then I am not so sure whether the same flexibility will remain or not, and therefore we keep this issue open. At present, we have not felt the necessity of altering that arrangement, that there remains flexibility with 49% government, but the management structure is created with deep and pervasive governmental control with IT firewalls built around it, 
and a penal consequences if any information is made public in order to secure the information. And therefore, we decided to continue the arrangement which was arrived at because it was arrived at after not just one straight decision but a series of consultations and decisions held under the previous government and by the empowered committee. And that empowered committee didn't belong to the government. Every government till today has made sure that the chairperson of the empowered committee is a person not belonging to the ruling party in power. The reason being we always appoint an empowered committee chairperson who is from one of the opposition parties so that a larger participation itself can go on. And in that structure, all the finance ministers of all the states, the finance ministers of the Congress, the other political parties, the left parties, the BJP, everybody has participated and come to this arrangement that the government has, along with the best advice, gone by that structure. And therefore, we must be clear that uh, this is how the GSTN itself was created. See, Naresh Agrawal had raised this issue, internationally tourists get a refund. Of course, in the IGST there is a provision in clause 15, the tourists do get a refund. What will happen uh, if there is a part uh, excise duty as in air conditioners and a part service? There is a provision as far as uh, composite supply is concerned. There are methodologies of taxing a composite supply which is part uh, manufacturing, part uh, services. A house for instance, the steel, cement, sanitary fittings, electricity fittings will all be excisable. The architect and the contractor will have to pay service charge. Restaurant, there will be excisable items, there will be a service tax element. These are composite supplies. And therefore the law obviously has a provision with regard to that. The arrest provisions. Now as far as the arrest provisions are concerned, service tax and excise law had some very stringent arrest provisions. In the last two finance bills, we have reduced them significantly. Some states in the VAT law had an arrest provision, some didn't have an arrest provision. Now, this was thoroughly debated by all the finance ministers. And there were clearly two views at the very outset. The first view was, why arrest? The second view was, Supposing a man defrauds 100 crore rupees, is the state government powerless? And he has no assets to recover it from. What do you do? What is the kind of deterrent? And then the wisdom of the committee itself was, the council, that they chose a middle path. They diluted the grounds in which an arrest can be made. And the grounds now are, you make a supply without any vouchers altogether. Or you have vouchers fakely created, forced, and no supply. Or you collect taxation and don't deposit it. Now these would otherwise also constitute forgery and uh, breach of trust. These three circumstances. Sharad Yadav Ji said that if you do something small, then you will arrest him, then he will not do it for small. So up to 2 crore fraud, no arrest. Now actually, some of the states which had a tougher, they said why should we allow 2 crore to a very large amount? From 2 to 5, or up to, from 2 to 5, if you arrest, it's bailable. After 5 crores, it is non-bailable. So it's only in the very big fraud cases where a man forges a complete transaction, it's only then that the arrest is made. Now, Mr. Satish Mishra, and these were the, this was the actual division as to should you have no arrest or should you have arrest only in rare cases? 
and with very stringent conditions. <coughs> Mr. Sadish Mishra wanted to know how does compounding and arrest coexist. Arrest is for the offence. Compounding is when prosecution is filed. The next stage. So after arrest, you are on bail or not on bail. When the prosecution is filed, there is a separate chapter which gives you the option of asking for a compounding on such payment as the rules may themselves prescribe. You have provided in subsection 5, 132, right? It will be bailable uh, offense. It can be bailed. No, you have said it will become non bailable. Why? Even under 132.5, under clause I, it is compoundable. So once it is compoundable, even after 5 crores, in that case, why you arrest? But it, a bailable question is bailable or non bailable. Other okay. matters, you are bailable. In this, you are making non bailable. Satish ji, 5 crores se zada wala hoga, to non bailable hoga. Even if it is compoundable. Even if it is compoundable. Everything is compoundable. 5 crores se zada wala non bailable hoga. Non bailable may be other kabi bail ho jati hai or baad mein prosecution file hoti hai. So, aap prosecution ke time pe kahenge, mein penalty dene ko tayar ho, tax or penalty mera compound kar di That's a separate uh, chapter altogether. Hmm. A question has been raised with regard to CAG. With regard to CAG, jo chota trader hai, ya um, trader hai, Joe audit cases hunge, those will be audited either by the state or the central governments or through their representatives. Whether the department itself is doing its duty as per law or not, the CAG has the overriding power to call for any case. Now a question arose whether we must have a provision in the act itself empowering the CAG. The current CAG wrote to me and suggested that you must put a provision in the Act. I took it to the GST Council. The Council said, none of the taxation law says we have the power to audit, that is the state government or the central government. The tax laws don't give CAG the power to audit. The authority of the CAG emanates from the Constitution and from the CAG Act itself. Therefore, this act need not have a special empowerment for the CAG. The CAG's empowerment comes from the constitution and the tax law itself. And therefore, those powers of the CAG to see whether a particular state government is auditing correctly or not, or the central is auditing or not, that remains under the CAG law itself. So that power is separate. This is in relation to the question that you have raised. Now, under this act, Presently, nine set of rules has to be made. Maybe in future some more may be required. We made five rules, made them public. Objections came after the act was, in, was draft was prepared. We have corrected those rules and those final rules have now been made public. The other four have also been approved tentatively, made public, but only as a democratic consultative provision if some objection comes and we have to make some marginal change, we are awaiting that which we will take up in the next meeting itself. Anti-profiteering. Clause 171. Now, anti-profiteering is to prevent an unjust enrichment. I'll give you an example. If it's a gray area, that obviously costing and pricing depends on several factors, that will be a defense. But if suddenly, let us say, let us take the case of white goods. Most white goods today are taxed, if you join total all the taxes, at about 31%. 31 to 32%. That's the highest way. There are many products जो अब केवल मिडिल क्लास नहीं लोअर मिडिल क्लास भी यूज करता है कल जीएसटी काउंसिल तय करती है कि उसको 18 कर देते हैं आई एम जस्ट गिविंग एन इलस्ट्रेटिव एग्जांपल अब इसका आपको 13% का बेनिफिट मिला अब ये 13 आपने अपनी जेब में डाल लिया या कंज्यूमर को दिया अगर आप कहें कि भाई कॉस्टिंग बढ़ गई रॉ मटेरियल की कीमत बढ़ गई इसलिए मैं 13 का 13 नहीं पास ऑन कर पाया मैं केवल 2% या 4% पास ऑन किया that may be a valid defense. 
but to say that you can pocket the benefit that you get from tax reduction, a law can't provide for it, and therefore an anti-profiteering provision has to be there. Now, which will be the body? The council will consider whether this function can be given to the CCI or their separate group is to be created. The council or a committee, government won't adjudicate. Tax officials won't adjudicate. Some independent quasi-judicial body will adjudicate this. And anti-profiteering clauses are there in most of these. Now, as I said, in 9 out of 10 cases today, textile or biscuits, you know your present rate of taxation, you have to indulge in your arithmetical calculation, and you are likely to come to the closest figure. This is why you have a biscuit part of the duty, it will not be enough. This is the arithmetical exercise. Unless the council consciously comes to a decision that some amount will really require to be reduced. Transition phase may taklif aayegi. Obvious hai. Taklif aayegi. Is liye transition provisions hai. Or transition provision mein kaise jo duties di gai hai, kyoi saal ke beech mein ho raha hai. Or pehle kuch mahino ke liye penalties vagara wave off karna. Taaki logo ko compliance difficulties na ho. Uska pravdaan transition provision ka pura chapter hai. MSME, या कई ऐसे केसेस में जहां डिफिकल्टी आएगी ये क्वेश्चन रेस किया गया क्लॉज 128 में पावर टू वेव ऑफ डिफिकल्टीज है एग्रीकल्चरल गुड्स इसमें नहीं आने वाले हैं इसलिए कपिल जी ने जो इशू रेस किया वो रजिस्ट्रेशन प्रोविजन का है कि उसको रजिस्ट्रेशन की आवश्यकता नहीं है आज अगर एग्रीकल्चरल प्रोडक्ट्स की जीरो रेटिंग है तो संभावना यही है जो काउंसिल की अप्रोच अभी तक है वो जीरो रेटिंग चलती रहेगी इसलिए कोई एग्रीकल्चरल गुड इसमें नहीं आने वाला है जो जो आज एग्जेम्प्टेड है कपिल जी जो आज एग्जेम्प्टेड है आप अश्वस्त रहे वो एग्जेम्प्टेड रहेगा और इसलिए जीएसटी की वजह से नहीं आने वाला है जो आज एंसिलरी भी एग्जेम्प्टेड है वो भी एग्जेम्प्टेड रहेगा और इसलिए जो दो सेक्शन टू फोर्टीन में आपने परिभाषा पढ़ी वो रजिस्ट्रेशन के लिए वो टैक्सेशन के लिए नहीं है और इसलिए आप मान के चलिए आप मान के चलिए एंड दिस इज आल्सो व्हाट माय फ्रेंड सीताराम सेड दोस 32 पीपल आल्सो रिप्रेजेंट फेडरलिज्म दे आल्सो हैव अ शेड सावरनिटी दे आर एस मच इलेक्टेड एस मच इज सम ऑफ़ आस आ एंड देवर दे आल्सो हैव द कंसर्न ऑफ़ एग्रीकल्चरिस्ट एंड द स्टेट गवर्नमेंट्स सो दिट कैन बी अ सिचुएशन and they have all agreed to a formulation which is against the interest of the states itself. <laughs> you see, the problem that is coming here, what Kapil has also raised, is suppose, you see, you have an ancillary like ghee is produced. Now, no, I mean, but like ghee is produced. Now, now, that is a taxable thing. Now, if such taxes are there, will the agriculturalist be exempted or will he be taxed? That's the present, the present point. You I mean, take it. Yeah. What is like? I, today I can just say I can't give up speak for the, but I can give you a, like indication of what is being discussed there. The present status quo will continue, and therefore the ministers there also have a very strong approach as far as protecting agriculturists are concerned. <laughs> but they are they are no. They, they need the votes of the agriculturists, and they have the concern of the agriculturists no less than me or you have. <laughs> They are also they are also closer to the agriculturists in their state. So why should they be deciding against the? And therefore, as far as industry is concerned, we have consultations at a very wide level itself. Now I really can't uh, restart this whole argument of to why the constitution provided for Article 110 and so on. That's an issue in the abstract we will continue to discuss as time passes by. 
But today, all I can say is, 2006, we embarked upon an idea which looked very difficult. It ran into hurdles. We've all learned from that experience with every day we've improved on the idea. And today, it's a collective property of this country. This bill is not really, if you ask me, the draft also, the legal committee has a larger participation of the state governments when they've drafted this. The state government has the right to put a mandi tax on it. When we talk about one tax, then we should put one tax on it. Mandi tax. Mandi tax. I'm sure Kalyan Shinde will agree with me. Mandi tax. Mandi tax. Mandi tax. Mandi tax. I'm sure council will take all these issues into consideration when they'll wait. So these are all, this has now matured into the shape of these bills. The rules have been prepared and now they have started working on the rates and hopefully sometimes the in fact, I can share with you the one of the suggestions was we must uh, decide in the month of May or June because in fixing rates a lot of uh, pressures and lobbying goes on. People think it's an opportunity to reopen the whole thing. Therefore, the arithmetical formula and the rationale behind this has been made public. So all the experts are now working on it. They are hearing people. And then the council itself in the month of May will take its final decision on this. As far as these... Anand. assessment and audit, a model GST law should have a very clear mechanism. What we see and kindly enlighten us is that the advanced ruling will be in multiples. The states where the registration takes place as well as in the center. So can't we have a centralized system where through the IGST mechanism these issues when it comes to state issues those can be duly addressed, but at the same time, the compliance complications and tediousness is avoided. This is just a, one of the issues that I had raised yesterday. Anandji, if you see uh, chapter 17, section 9 onward of the CGST law, there is an advance ruling authority and an appellate authority over the advance ruling authority which itself has been created. And uh, this authority will be separate in every state because a lot of those issues, a very large number of these assessments are going to take place. The assessees are going to be in the states. The question Mr. Yachuri had raised, below 1.5, and one of the reasons we agreed, much to the contrary, that some of uh, the officials in the revenue service had a different view. Service tax is being assessed today by the center. A large number of these small traders for VAT are being assessed in the states. And suddenly you don't want the entire machinery of the center to go from shop to shop assessing those people. So 90-10 was the division, and above 1.5 crore, the division is 50-50. Bulk of the quantum wise amounts are above 1.5. The volume wise, it's there. See, I so the advanced ruling the chapter. The concern is also not only about goods, but also about pan-Indian services. That's where the complication. No, therefore, is. therefore, I told you under clause 148, we have a special provision for a category of cases with regard to audit. Let us, for example, take a large bank has to be audited. A large public sector bank has to be audited. You can have a joint team of a state and the center auditing that bank itself. For the purposes of registration, there is some inconvenience involved. I had strongly advocated a centralized registration. The banks and the insurance companies wanted a centralized. The states, therefore, had a different view. And therefore, the state's view prevailed but then we had a via media for the purposes of audit after that registration. We, for a class of cases, there can be a separate mode of uh, audit itself to take care and to somehow dilute the hardship. So we have an advanced ruling provision itself. 
Now, these are all four legislations which have been unanimously approved by the council. And therefore, sir, I have tried to deal with most of the questions which have been raised. I am raising one concern, which I want you to answer, I mean, not, not of scoring points, but of concern because this is going to be legislation that will remain for, for many generations after we are not there also. So, I mean, one of the issues that has been of serious concern for us is the growth of economic imbalances that are regional. Now, regional economic imbalances, today you have a situation where it is a 3-3-3. Three, three, three. The richest state, three richest states, are three times richer than the three poorest states. That is the Indian reality. Now, with a centralized tax, a generalized tax, such a pattern of economic imbalances is likely to continue to rise. Now, what is the counter that you have thought of or what are the provisions in the future that can do? Because now the tempering effect of uh, having a planning commission also is not there for regional imba economic imbalances. Now, how is it going to be incorporated within the framework of the GST? Have you thought about this? Or, 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 or what Sir, do you think is the future roadmap? There are two or three points which you may consider. GST in that sense is more equitable. Because it leans in favor of the consuming states being a destination tax. And therefore, inherently, the consuming states are going to benefit. If any state consuming or producing loses, its compensation is protected for some period of time. Then how to compensate a state which has to grow? For instance, today you have the Northeast and the Himalayan states. There is a special provision which the Finance Commission then makes. There is an extreme category which has also been provided, supposing some state faces a challenge, a drought, a flood, what do you do? Does it unilaterally increase its SGST? There is a procedure. The council can then, considering the special circumstances of the state, permit them. So these are inbuilt mechanisms which have been created in the council itself. अभी कोई भी व्यापारी को केवल चार बार साल में रिटर्न भरना पड़ता है। अब नए बिल में 37 रिटर्न भरने पड़ेंगे। क्या इसके बारे में कुछ जानकारी देंगे? ऐसे इसमें भी प्रावधान है कानून में जो कल आपने पॉइंट रेस किया क्वार्टरली रिटर्न्स का। इसमें भी क्वार्टरली रिटर्न्स का है। और इसलिए इसलिए जो सारा का सारा सिस्टम धीरे-धीरे ऑनलाइन जाएगा, उससे सहूलियत बढ़ेगी, कम नहीं होगी। दिन है आपको, 10 तारीख को, 15 तारीख को, 20 तारीख को, और उसके बाद एन्युअल रिटर्न अलग देना है आपको। Please verify। Minister did not listen. My question is, sir, if later on it is found that he had not defrauded the state or the exchequer for more than five crores and he has suffered this imprisonment for a long period, what action will be taken against the officers who passed this order? Would the same provisions be also applicable to the officers? Because otherwise there will be a lot of corruption if the deterrent is not put there. Okay.